the texts tell us that when the Buddha was newly awakened, he surveyed the world. And on the one hand, he saw how everyone was aflame with passion, aversion, delusion, burning from these things. And he felt compassion. But then he reflected on the, the drama that he discovered, and he realized how much it went against what people wanted, wanted to hear, how subtle it was, how hard it would be for them to understand. And he almost gave up the idea of teaching. It was only after Brahma's invitation and when the Buddha himself reflected on the fact there would be people who would understand. That's why he taught. Notice the dynamic there. There is the compassion, but there's also the sense that it was going to be very difficult. And he needed to be convinced that it was worthwhile. That was why he taught. And one of the main problems he faced was that the fire burning away in our minds was something that we really liked, particularly the fire of passion. When the Buddha says that we're attached to sensuality, it's not so much sensual things. We are attached to our passion for sensual things, our obsession with sensual things. We love to think about sensual pleasures. And if we can't get one sensual, sensual pleasure, well, we're happy to think about another one. We're really attached to the things that make us suffer. We think of passion as a good thing. As we said today, a lot of people say, how could you live without passion? Well, think about that for a minute. What does that mean? We need the oomph of passion to overcome an awful lot of inertia. To live is to struggle. We have to feed. We have to provide for the needs of the body. This is one of the reasons why we have that contemplation of the requisites every evening. We have this need for food, clothing, shelter, medicine. And if the body, once it was born, was perfectly complete, we wouldn't need these things. And yet we're born with a big lack. Our parents provide for us when we're young. There comes a point there where we have to provide for ourselves. And it's not easy, and it's not just our own effort that goes into providing for ourselves. There's a lot of suffering that goes into the fact that we have food to eat. Even if you're vegetarian, there are the, the farmers who have to work at growing the food, the transport workers, transport workers who have to bring the food from the farm to the market, the people who work in the market, the people who have to cook, all these people are involved in a lot of, a lot of effort. That's just the food. Similar things for clothing, shelter, medicine. There's a long chain of suffering that goes into providing these things. And even then, the body is full of aches and pains. And you notice this more and more as you get older. It doesn't ask permission. This part begins to wear down, that part begins to wear down. And you find yourself with less and less to work with. And to get over the barrier of that inertia takes a fair amount of passion, which is why we see passion as a good thing. But it is a fire that keeps burning away. And so the Buddha had a twofold solution. One is to direct the passion in a skillful direction. Learning to 
get the mind motivated for things that really are helpful, really do lead to a, a true and lasting happiness. Because for the most part, many of our passions are totally misguided. And we just say, well, focus your passion toward the Dharma, finding the happiness that comes from generosity, the happiness that comes from virtue, from being principled in your behavior, and the happiness that comes from the meditation. It compares us to food, and particularly the sense of well-being, rapture, refreshment that come from getting the mind into good, strong concentration. That's food on the path. It gives you energy. And his various teachings on the things that can be attained as we practice. That's the motivation that gives you the passion for the Dharma, that helps overcome the inertia that otherwise would keep us from acting. But then beyond that, the Buddha, the Buddhist final solution, well, that's a bad term for that, the ultimate solution to the problem, was to get rid of that inertia, the baggage that weighs the mind down, that we have to fight against in order to accomplish anything. That's why he has us look at our attachments. There's a Pali word, upati, which means baggage. It derives from a, a term that nomads would use, when nomads would pick up their tents and their food and all their belongings and pack them on horses and move on. All, all the belongings were called upati, the baggage that you carry around with you. that extra weight that creates that dead sense of inertia. This is why we have to look very carefully into the mind, why we practice concentration so we can get the mind in a place where it can really can see very clearly. The steps by which it functions, where it creates these burdens, where it creates this massive baggage that it's holding on to, in terms of your greed, your aversion, your delusion, identifying with your body, identifying with your feelings, your perceptions, your thought fabrications, even acts of consciousness. These things weigh the mind down if you hold on to them. So this is the Buddha's primary mode of attack. When you see the mind holding on to something, and holding on here, you have to realize it's metaphorical. The mind doesn't have hands that it grabs things with, but it has habits that it keeps repeating over and over again. The places it goes to for its happiness, the things it does again and again and again, partly because it doesn't know any better, partly because it's habitual. But it's precisely in looking into our attachments that we can begin to see what creates the inertia and how we can lighten the mind. Ideas that you hold on to, that weigh you down, that keep you back. Ways of, ways of functioning that keep you back. That's why the Buddha has you let go of these things. You see that they weigh you down, they cause stress. As a John Mahabha would say, they put a squeeze on the mind. They're dead weight on the mind. Then you find that as the mind gets lighter and lighter, it has less and less need for passion. It has less and less inertia that it has to overcome. So when we think about the Buddhist teachings, to really comprehend them, to appreciate them, you really have to go think outside the box. When the Buddha says the mind in nirvana no longer has to feed, we tend to focus immediately on our idea. Well, the mind is constantly feeding on sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations, relationships, ideas, intentions. And so he talks about the mind 
not feeding it sounds like it's being starved. What's actually happening is the mind has gotten in such a strong place it doesn't need to feed anymore. The same with passion. We think a life without passion would be dead and dull, because all we know is the inertia of a mind that can't stir up passion to do anything. But the Buddha was aware of a state of mind that doesn't have that inertia, doesn't have that dead weight, and so can do the wise thing, the helpful thing, the skillful thing, the compassionate thing without needing the passion, because it's not weighed down. So as we're practicing, we have to bring passion to practice, because the mind still has its baggage, a lot of resistance that we have to overcome. That's why the Buddha talks about passion for the Dharma as a good thing on the path. And so when you find that your efforts are getting slack, you do what you can to remind yourself of why we're here practicing, what the alternative would be if there were no way of training the mind, to free it from its burdens, to free it from its fires of passion, aversion, and delusion, the fevers that come to the mind. And we use the passion for the Dharma to replace our other passions, to keep us on the path. But as we become more and more passionate we, for the Dharma, we find that we can see more and more clearly exactly where it is that we've been weighing ourselves down. And you can drop all the weight, like those old balloons that people used to travel in, that have big bags full of weights, and then when the balloon was ready to go up, they would drop drop the weights, drop the weights, and the balloon would rise higher and higher. The same way with the practice. As the mind gets lighter and lighter, your passion gets more refined. And ultimately, when it's totally weightless, that's when you no longer need the passion. It's good to remember that a lot of things that we tend to value in life are because of a lack. We value food because we feel hungry. We value passion because it helps us to overcome our inertia. The mind that no longer needs to feed and a mind that's totally weightless. Looks at food and feels no inclination, doesn't need it anymore, looks at passion and sees it as the Buddha did, simply as a fever, from which he was glad to be freed. <laughs>